And we have our farmers here, I'm pretty sure they've been promoted to panelists. Um, so we have uh, Travis Albright, uh, he's been with us all day. He has been um, answering lots of your questions. He is our ag advisor and is also a, a farmer. Uh, we also have Jeremy Wind, who's going to be joining us. Uh, Jeremy is a potato farmer from Alberta, and it was actually his field uh, that Scotty just talked about in his presentation. Um, and then we also have Ken Farian joining us, and he is a producer from up north uh, in Vegerville, Alberta. Uh, he'll be about two minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, he's coming here right now. Here, I'll get out of his seat. Hello. And I don't know if, uh, Travis, you kind of maybe want to start this discussion? Uh, sure. Hey, Jeremy. Good to see you, Mater. Oh, you're muted, Jeremy. Oh, there. I'm muted. No, that's yeah, going. Now you're all good. Okay, so I guess uh, just kind of wondering if there was any other uh, questions, I guess, for from the audience for uh, the growers here, I guess, is, is, the, is the biggest thing to, to go over, really. As these growers agreed to, to talk about their experiences, and, and that's where I do believe farmers do learn the most of, of practical experience and, and talking to other farmers. Um, just trying to check the Q&A uh session here and i guess well ken we might as well start with you and i guess uh describe what you've seen on your farm this year was this was your second year using acf correct yes you ready there yep go go for yeah, it uh, this is uh, last year on all our cereals we used uh used it uh we uh treat our seed with it. Approximately, uh, we treat about 12 bushels to a liter of brood stuff. Uh, and then we put two gallons with our starter fertilizer. And then we give another two gallons uh, after the broadleaf spraying is done. Uh, since we started doing this, we uh, eliminated the use of seed treatments and the use of fungicides. I was a little disappointed on Bill's uh, uh, plot work around Lethbridge, I, I really would hope in the next year he would incorporate not using a seed treatment and not using a fungicide. Uh, I think there's a great potential of, we might not get the biggest yield, but we'll take the most money to the bank with a product like this. So I think that should all be incorporated in your sites and data. Uh, though the future of this, I think is pretty great. Uh, we are going to do the same thing next year we see treated or this this spring i guess and uh we'll start playing a little bit on canola and on oats that's it travis for for a starter okay no that's good uh i got a question from from cody uh yeah actually we ended up gaining like that is actually how i'm the only guy in my area pulling two cuts of hay I'm not in irrigation. I'm up, I do get lots of heat units, I guess, but I have, I'm in a really, really dry area. So we have all of our alfalfa seeded in high salinity spots where we had water table issues. So for the most part, we, we do get the moisture in those low areas. And with using ACF, we, we actually put down zero synthetic fertilizers when we seeded our alfalfas into these spots. As soil tests show, there was uh, more than sufficient amounts of of NPK and S in these high salinity areas, it just uh, was unavailable and the high salts were, were, were always killing our crops off. So the ACF has seemed to mitigate a lot of the salts for us once we got our, our alfalfa established and sucked the water table down. But yeah, I do credit ACF getting me a, a second cut and um, I actually have sprayed native pasture. It is hard to see actual growth differences on native. We're going to do a lot more with native pasture this year on our ranch land. We're going to aerial apply uh, 160 acres of ACF through an airplane and, and see what it does uh, on that full quarter section as the quarter is way too rough to 
um, get a sprayer across. Uh, on a side note, though, we uh, on the water side, I, I don't really run our ranch side. My wife does. And I do notice as we are treating our dugouts with the, the advanced egg combo packs instead of copper sulfate, we actually do see our cows basically not maybe eating less grass, but getting more out of the grass as we can run more head per, per acre. And even in our severe droughts that we had in uh, 2017, 18 and 19, we were grazing more cows on the same amount of grass than we ever have. So hopefully that uh, answers your question, Cody. Uh, uh, Nigel's question. Uh, I don't know the answers to Nigel's question, so Sheva will have to archive them and and uh, get them answered via email. I guess I'll kind of turn it over to Jeremy, and uh, you might as well just tell your story a little bit, Jeremy, about what crops you've applied ACF on and what you've seen with your your Timothy and alfalfa and potatoes, if you don't mind. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me okay? Yep, perfect, Jeremy. All right, so, well, we started... I think about four years ago, we started with some alfalfa and did it at the end of the year. It was kind of, we were going to try it. In irrigation, we get four cuts. So we applied it in between the third and fourth cut. I didn't see any difference visibly, but bailed it separately. And the bales coming out of the ACF area were significantly heavier, like four to 500 pounds each. So that was... That was our first experience with it. Uh, we continued on. We've been trying it on Timothy. We've, we've uh, put ACF on Timothy for two years straight now. We can see a significant difference in in grow back between each cut. Uh, it, it starts coming back faster. It starts getting color better, which is a big thing in the Tim Timothy industry. Um, and our big thing is potatoes. Um, in the horticulture world, they, we are continually getting pushed, less pesticides, less fertilizers, all this kind of stuff. So we started uh, doing some experiments with it. Uh, we had a field this year. It's a bit of a story, but I'll get to the point. Uh, last year, we had wheat on it. We did ACF on the west half of the field because the west half was considerably higher in alkaline, and we've had issues growing anything in that area. So we did that. We didn't see a huge difference in the wheat. It, it did grow. So even that was for us. The next year went in potatoes. Same thing. We treated the west half, did not do the east half. Uh, we treated the potatoes exactly the same other than that. So uh, we put them in the bin. Coming off the harvester, we didn't notice a huge difference. But about three months later, we started having rod issues. And... and went to ship them out and we mark exactly where we switch halves in a, in, in a field. We mark it in the bin. So when we got up to the spot where we switch halves, the rot stopped completely. Uh, the defects lowered and, and the size profile changed. It, it was incredible. It was, it was this perfect line in the bin. Unfortunately, we didn't document much more of it, but um, and then lastly, Oh, we, we did some, on that same field, we did some soil testing work. So uh, we compared 2018 to the soil samples from this fall, from the fall of uh, 2020. And the alkaline levels or the sodium levels have come down probably by 20% in two years. So it's kind of a lot of information, but that's our story. No, awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. And I've seen that uh, on our farm too. And, and I'm glad you're seeing it on your farm, especially with irrigation as you know, it's a little easier for me to control the water when we have droughts and I'm sucking a lot of moisture with the alfalfa where you're still pounding the water to all the crops that you're growing and, and the salinity is, is going down, which is, which is fantastic. Comment? Yeah, you bet you can. Uh, Jeremy, uh, my potato, potato production is a lot less than yours. We had four rows in the garden, 
sprayed two and two I never. Uh, visually, there was a difference in top growth, probably double the biomass. In the potato, they were scab free on the sprayed stuff. But the most interesting thing is when we picked them, the boiling time of the sprayed potatoes is probably double of the non-sprayed ones. They're so much denser. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. So in, in other words, your, your cell structure is is better. And that probably ties into when we said the, the half that wasn't sprayed started rotting. Well, that usually indicates either disease or a cell structure issue. And, and in my opinion, the ACF is allowing those potatoes to uptake calcium better, which creates a better cell wall. Yeah, I'm no potato expert either. My uh, potato growing uh, expertise is about like Ken's, but everybody's seen that picture of that potato I grew in my garden and, and we had lots almost the same size and, and everybody, you know, thought they were just going to taste gross or have hollow heart or anything. And, and they were perfect the whole way through and with the beets and carrots, they're, they're some of the sweetest vegetables that we've ever grown. And I have noticed everything that we treat heavily in the garden does taste better, including our, our raspberries in our, in our raspberry patch, very small areas, but that's kind of, you know, everybody tests stuff in their garden because you usually don't go broke farming your garden. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. I've seen huge uh, uh, advantages. I use it on my lawn and it, it works great. Now hearing, do you guys spray it all on, I imagine? Uh, yeah. Actually, I'm, uh, I have uh, liquid kits on my drill, so... Most of ours is in furrow, uh, just for timing as I'm, I'm working in the office with Josh and, and on the road uh, to help support. So we, we do a lot of in furrow work just to try to cut down the first pass and then we'll stage it to rain just because it has been so dry. We've been just going with the, the two gallons in furrow and, and kind of walking away over the last three to four years. Uh, this year, now that we're going in, with uh, substantial sub moisture because of all the snow we've got, we're gonna increase part of our farm up to four gallons an acre. And just because all the other uh, inputs are getting uh, crazy, we're gonna really, really lean on the, on the ACF. And we're, gonna, we're actually gonna try some, this fields this year, just running straight ACF, four gallons in furrow and, and walking away on a quarter up against our regular fertility programs. But, we're we're really going down down the road of, of less and less synthetics um we do have i know a farmer that isn't on this panel today but i know he uh he accomplished six thousand acres of durham last year with zero applied p and had a had a monster crop so this will be year two on on his six thousand acres with zero applied p and uh using some of our product so it, it's quite exciting what uh you know can can be accomplished when when uh growers pay attention um, I guess I can ask uh, Nigel has a question. What fertilizers I mix in furrow? Uh, I do run Alpine uh, G22, the low salt FOSS starter with my AF in our drill. Uh, from that picture at the beginning, we have a liquid cart with two tanks. One is liquid and in the sulfur that's side banded. And then in the, in the other tank, we have G22 mixed with um, mixed with ACF, so we're we're putting down usually two gallons an acre of ACF and four to five gallons uh, of Alpine through the the second distribution line. Scotty, you got any comments? I'm pretty quiet. I thought you'd be in on this. Well, I, I certainly could add in there. You know me. <laughs> I had to uh, rush through my presentation because I was told to make sure it's a half hour or I'd be in trouble. <laughs> so, right, yeah. I, I got her done, though. Uh, uh, folks, no, really, um, by and large, from wherever I've gone, um, it's been remarkably positive. There's been some hay fields where it's worked reasonably well, and then all of a sudden, five miles down the road, it's it's uh, there's some moving parts in there. Um but by and large, the only thing that I'm, I'm trying to curious and figure out is canola. You know, it, it's just not giving me great ROI. But I'm talking to growers all the time. Some pulse crop guys are out there. They throw fungicides to the wind and they're just enthralled with it. And Jeremy, like, like you're saying, the fruits and vegetable guys in the county in Ontario, where I've been doing a lot of work there, they too are just enthralled with what they're seeing. Like there's one uh, chap who put it on onions. He's the guy that did the sweet potatoes. 
the buyer, apparently the story goes, the buyers came in, looked at the section that was treated and they wanted to buy those onions right away. Like they were just sold because they're all the same size. There was no disease. And so what's that worth to the producer? Like I really appreciate what you guys have been saying today is, you know, I sometimes get lost in the data. I, I, I'm guilty as charged, right? Because that's really my thing. But there's so many other parts to the story that are critical. The root mass, uh, the quality. There's, like Jeremy, I, I'm really pleased to hear that the potatoes really showed you the differentiation in the storage bin. That's really exciting because I know we saw what we did in your fields where it was moderately saline, but some of the growth lines were kind of there. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. sometimes you, you don't see it all the time. You go, oh, you know, but then you hear that story. It's like, wow. I mean, yeah, that one, yeah. that one did impress us. Yeah, yeah, that is well, true. And, and the field, actually, you showed in your presentation, uh, yeah, this, it was an area that normally wouldn't grow potatoes at all. It did grow potatoes. Unfortunately, about a week after that picture was taken, it got hailed out completely. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't see any yield results on that one. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I like the turf thing, like uh, in the, uh, the the golf course industry. Um, I saw a question come up from a chap who's using Eco T, and you know, would the ACF be of a, a different nature? That's a tough question. I'd I'd love to uh, do a side by side to see what different are there because I know when we sat down with a whack of scientists last fall, almost I mean last winter, a year today, that it's really the functionality, not what's in the product so much, but the functionality that it generates in the soil that is really key to this. And when I go to these world congresses and I sit in these lectures, these like today was a great day. I, I enjoyed the presentation because I like that stuff. Right. But you know, that's what these presentations I'm picking up as I travel are all about. And it's, it's about the functionalities that we can generate and how do we create the buzzword of uh, regenerative farming that becomes more sustainable Travis, you lean on that in your own farm in terms of being able to pull some of the uh, applications of nitrogen back so that it's not so disruptive. But you can't do that overnight. Like even what four or five years doing that? Uh, yeah, we, we we started in 2015, starting to reduce. So yeah, and then now in 2021, we'll be down 70 percent of of what we used to be. Right, um, but it, it, it's a progression for sure. And even to speak to uh, what Jeremy sees in quality, we, we have seen quality increases with, with our pulse crops hands down. Uh, majorly, uh, the big one is on the lentils. They just keep grade better even when we're getting some rains during harvest. Last couple of years hasn't been an issue, but 2016 was a huge issue with, with too much rain at harvest. And, and all of our, our lentils come off top grade compared to anywhere else in, in Western Canada. We have been tracking protein levels for a few years in our pulses, and they're they're always uh, two, sometimes four percent higher. It used to never make a difference, but now they are starting to pay protein premiums on on peas, and I think they're going to start paying protein uh, increases on on lentils also. So we are going to start to see money back for that. I guess on a side note, we we keep all of our screenings and run them through cows. So the higher proteins have really been uh, a huge winner for us on that aspect. Uh, the barley is high high protein, and so are pulses. So it just makes for really good cattle feed for us also. But biggest thing is quality. Even on our Durham, when we're when we're seeing droughts, we're we're holding bushel weights in there, and I actually think that attributes, uh, especially in southern Alberta, we're really high in K in our soils, but it's uh, all locked up, and you know. I do believe the ACF is solubilizing that K to help us hold bushel weights and help uh, help reduce the stress of those plus 40 days with with no rain. Um, I think Joel, I got a message here on uh, on the Q and A that you'd like to answer one of uh, uh, Nigel's questions live. Is that correct? Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Yes, I. Well. <laughs> oh, go, go for it, Joel. I actually want to hear the answer because I didn't know the answer to this question at all. So it'd be great. Well, actually, I was going to answer it and I accidentally hit the wrong button. Um, and um, uh, rather than type, I uh, mentioned I would answer it live. But anyway, unfortunately, I was just going to say, sorry, no, I don't know the answer. I don't know much about plasma in um, crop or soil system. So I didn't actually have an answer for that question. So <laughs> that's all I was going to oh, say. All good because... 
<laughs> I didn't have one either, so I was kind of hoping you had one, but all good. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's one there for Scotty. Uh, I'm not sure if you pulled up the q and I'll just read it to you, Scotty. Uh, can I suggest that you keep canola crop green later on so feather, calcium, potassium, boron, and introduce ACF in late in application? Did you read that one, Scotty? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Um, okay. Yeah, N Nigel, I've always wondered about that because I have worked with some products really late in the season. Uh, and canola, believe it or not, there's a, a study years ago on canola, and we all recognize that the leaves on canola are gone well before it's anywhere near finished, uh, the, finishing the seed in the pods. And the pods are generating 80% of the photosynthetic production to actually finish that pod. So it would make clear sense that a late season application on the crop would help it finish. And maybe that's, maybe that's something to look at in terms of a trial uh, maybe Jeff Cross might even be able to speak to that if he didn't have any late season applications on canola that might have pushed the canola to the next level. Because if you do that and you can increase the potassium, molybdenum, and boron, um, you're gonna have, you might end up with more uh, you end up with more oil. I, I, that'd be a good question to have answered. Another spend that money on research. Here we go. I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure what what it does for late season. Um, definitively, um, we did some with and without, and I don't know if there was any difference at all. But um, <clears throat> so I don't really have a, a good answer at that. We did three gallons in furrow with it, and and uh, it jumped out of the ground. I think it definitely helped with. <clears throat> flea beetle suppression. We didn't have any flea beetle issues at all. And uh, just simply because I think the, the plant was so healthy that the the bugs stayed away from the flea beetles stayed away from it. But um, as far as, uh, you know, the, later in the year too, we, we ran out of moisture. So that was a big issue out where we were this year. I guess, Jeff, um, now that you you joined us, I think you're. Are you still out in the in Revelstoke? I'm in Banff right now. Oh, okay, yeah. No, wishing uh, wishing I was out where you were instead of uh, yeah. Rosetown, Saskatchewan. That's for sure. But uh, maybe uh, talk a little about your experience with the ACF and the and the chickpeas because that seemed to be where you kind of had your home runs with ACF was on your chickpea crops. Um, <clears throat> it was good on the chickpeas, like really good the first year I did it. Um. I don't believe you can put it in furrow with a seed treatment. I think that was a total waste because um, it didn't, for whatever reason, it didn't do the same thing as it did when I applied it with a foliar app uh, when the chickpeas popped up. Um, <clears throat> so it, you know, I think I, I, I wouldn't, if you're going to seed treat your chickpeas, then I wouldn't put it in furrow because I, I don't think that works. But I do think what works is, is you, you let your chickpeas pop up two inches and then you do your first application is when you, is when you'd start that. And then it'll get the, the nice vibrant green growth on it. Um, and then I think you'll have a better chance of suppressing your, your disease issues. But um, you know, we tried some other stuff as well and it seemed to some other biological stuff from Josh and it seemed to, it seemed to work quite well for about, for disease suppression for about, I don't know, probably 12, 14 days. Um, the yields on the chickpeas weren't as good this year. I got some hail, so I didn't really, didn't really get them finished up like I did the year before. What I did notice though, is the biggest thing I've noticed was on soil testing uh, now. So this is, I think our second year doing it, you know, and in order to grow a 60 bushel canola crop, I don't need any more micros on our, on our, um, um, I'm not using any starter FOSS, like nothing at all. I'm just using some, uh, some liquid orthophosphate for starter. Um, so, you know, it, there, what, what the plant or what we, what the soil is telling us is, is that it's getting better, uh, for a 60 bushel canola crop, I'm not getting any calls for any sulfur. So I don't think I need any sulfur. I basically need about 96 pounds of nitrogen where, in order to get a 60 bushel crop, we used to be probably around that 150, 160 range is what it would call for. So then the nitrogen is dropping 
Um, all, all the synthetic fertilizers are, are actually falling right off and our boron levels are good. Our zinc levels are good. Every, everything's quite good. So, so that's going to cut our costs down on our, <clears throat> on our starter program significantly, like 40 bucks and 35, 40 bucks an acre. Um, on your soil but, test, uh, Jeff, did you see an increase in some of your micronutrient levels on your soil test this year? All of them. Yeah. All, all of them. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And, and also another one that was interesting, we talked about it before, but uh, you've seen an increase on, on sulfur and on your soil tests and you haven't been being, haven't been adding any extra sulfur. So no. it's, uh, it's quite interesting. No, and it, it takes time. Like it's not a one year patch fix. So anybody that's going to do it and think that they are going to have like these magical, wonderful results year one, you got to be a bit patient with it. I think you got to, do it for a couple of years to start seeing it similar to what you said travis um it really yeah. responds to barley though you see you'll see like we had a we had a huge barley crop this year and it was super dry so yeah. it you know i i think it I, I honestly there's no on any of the crops that we use it there's no reason not to use it because at the very minimum you're going to be a wash in costs because number one you're going to get rid of all your seed treatments, which are garbage. And you're going to get rid of, you're going to probably get rid of all of your fungicides, which is garbage too. And, you know, we used to apply those things by the pailful and, and they worked sometimes and sometimes didn't. And, you know, I, I just think you're better off running this and trying to make your plant healthy from the start, right from the start, instead of trying to bandaid it with a super expensive fungicide application three quarters of the way through the season where, you know, if the moon isn't shining just right, it, you know, that was the reason why it didn't work. So, yeah, so I, yeah, I agree on, on our farm also, it's more than just yield. Um, we're, we're in it, you know, for the long haul. And then basically uh, Joel's presentation that he, that he today is, is basically why we're using it. Uh, I'm dead opposite of Jeff. Jeff farms just outside of Regina with very, like what I consider high organic matter soil between, you know, five to seven and I'm, you know, 0.8 to two. And I, I'm all about increasing organic matter where I'm at because I'm dry. I want to increase organic matter as fast as I can to try and help with water retention because we, we just seem to dry out after June. It rain is just so elusive and, and snows can be sporadic. So you know, we, we look at it as a, as a whole, almost two generation change that's, that's coming on our farm from where we were to where, where we're going um, and what we want to do with our farm. And yeah, we, we do want to drive yields higher if we can, but uh, we're also happier now if we can grow more net money at the end of the day, because we, we were trying to push yields with really high rates of synthetic fertilizer, which I think 90% of the farmers are. And the, the highest yield and the, and the highest expense crop sure didn't have the most net money. We're really working on net money and soil health and the overall picture on our farm more so than trying to set yield records because I, I don't see a whole lot of yield record setting crops being the most profitable year in, year out, especially on dry land. Scotty, you unmuted. Right. You must have something you want. I gotta, yeah, I got to ask this. We may have some potato guys out there. Uh, and Jeremy, you might be able to. Anybody use it with? 1034 at all because I'm, I'm i think i'm coming up with some ideas but i'm just curious are there any potato producers in southern alberta that used it with just straight 1034 around or is that jeremy could answer that yeah well i could i could answer what we've done we haven't mixed it yeah with, with straight n at all uh, we've only mixed it in furrow with uh, with a starter fertilizer. Especially, uh, especially starter. Yeah, it, well, it's a it's a phosphate starter, but yes, it is a specialty starter. Okay. I do know, Scotty. Um, there was two to three farmers that were using it uh, that got product from ICI that were mixing it with 1034 in the potato planter and putting it down the chute with 1034. But from what I know about the potato planters, they were empty, like every, every pass or every second pass, they're empty, right? So right. I was answering everybody's questions today. Uh, and, and we've asked these guys because a couple of them have their own agronomists for their farm. And they say it's working, you know, as good or better than they, than they expected. So 
I think it's all about mixing time. I think if we're an hour or less, I guess with 1034, we're kind of using that as a baseline right, right now, Scotty. I don't think for broad acre guys, when you're mixing it in 3000 or 4,000 gallon uh, tow behind carts, I don't uh, think it's a good idea to try it uh, with 1034. Uh, and yep. if you do try it, I guess only fill your tank to maybe 500 gallons of 1034 and hundred gallons of ACF or whatever, and do it on a trial basis and figure out what works for your farm. Okay, thanks. You betcha. And I guess if you're looking for any more information on that, Scotty Howell will be the guy to uh, to talk to. Okay. Travis, I'd yep. like to add one more thing. Well, I'm up in Beggarville, up on the, sort of the Highway 16 corridor, and we're very bad for frost. One thing I did notice uh, the last two years in using it was we speed up maturity on wheat at least a week. Uh, got a neighbor that we usually... Our practices are very similar and our land is all intertwined. Uh, we were down to, uh, we finished our wheat harvest and he was on his second day starting. Uh, so we gained at least a week on our maturity. Uh, if it happens to be a frost year, that's very big for us. Oh, uh, I, I can believe that. And were you swamped out this year again, Ken, like in high moisture? We had a few questions before. Um, kind of with waterlogged soils. Did you see anything where it helped where you guys were getting too much rain to a point? I, you know, there's a, only a, a point to how good stuff can work when you're just getting monsooned in, but did you see anything? Well, we were, uh, we had a normal year till about June 4th, June 5th, and then we got 11 inches of rain. And then July was just about wet, just as wet. And then August would start to slow down. We only got five or six. We got to the point where we were so waterlogged uh, it did for a while it helped, but then uh, when you get so much more, it didn't make a difference. So, uh, I can't really give you an order. Hoping... There was just so much water. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's only a point to, you can't, you can't fight mother nature if it's going to be a disaster to, to some point at, at the end of the day. Uh, it'd be interesting going in this spring, if what? you guys are really wet. One other comment. Oh, yeah, Travis, just a little bit on a, on a note of salvaging crops. We were, we put most of our fertilizer on polarly and we were adding some Kugler, uh, I think it was 2075 to a canola crop, made a couple passes across the section. And I thought it's just this, I'm not throwing away good money. Where we made those couple passes, we doubled our yield. So, right. so uh, experience hurts. Yeah, yeah, it, it sure can. And uh, sometimes you, you just uh, never know what's going to work and what doesn't work. And I know it's hard to watch uh, you lose a crop. I've never lost one with too much water, but I've sure lost more than my fair share in the last four years uh, to drought. Um, and same here, you know, we, we seen before we got really, really dry, we seen the, the fields that we've applied uh, ACF on four years faithfully hang in there better. But at the end of the day, when it's the limiting factor, it, it still will, will go upside down on you. Um, I had one question here from Joshua or from Nigel. Um, I guess, Nigel, where I farm, I have really high soil pH, like it's 7.8 to 8.2 is our worst quarter. So we have really high pH. So I, I use ACF for the, the FOSS and K tie up because of the pH. Uh, just because the FOSS will be bound by, by pH in our soils. And we also have uh, high mag, so it's super tight. So we're, we're trying to basically use ACF to help break down the, the bonds with uh, the pH and the, and the FOSS and, uh, and the magnesium to, to try and, and, and hold more water. I think we're getting through all of the questions. Uh, any of the farmers have anything else to add that we that we haven't covered? I think you're right on one point too. Like it doesn't. What what I'm seeing now is that, like we used to run super high fertility rates, and what I'm starting to see now is is that's not really the answer. Um, our best field of canola this year had our lowest amount of fertilizer. We had 76 pounds of nitrogen on it and it ran 57.9 bushels to the acre. And my brother's stuff that was just down the road and had 150 pounds on it, 
it it uh, it was forty nine bushels to the acre, and so uh, basically the same rainfalls, um, not much different land. Um, I just had I just had uh, significantly more. I had an, I had an extra pass of ACF on mine, and I also had some other Kugler products on mine. But that being said, is I think the 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 ACF significantly unties a lot of the nutrients in the ground that are sitting there and you know soil tests are are showing it so we're gonna we're gonna keep at it and and i think it gets better and i think it's just a matter of figuring out different rates for different crops and and the barley was phenomenal how it responded to it yeah and we we've, we've just seen like the assimilations with with barley are really good and 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 on we have seen it in in durham and spring wheat also um, like I said, not so much in bushels. There's, there's usually two to four bushel increase, but, uh, definitely on the protein and, and bushel weights, uh, on the wheat and Durham for sure. And there's definitely going to be premiums coming, um, within the next year to year and a half, there's going to be, there's going to be premiums coming out. Um, uh, we're pretty sure on, on lentils, field peas, uh, Durham, and a handful of other stuff, even barley, there's going to be a premium for it. And it's basically, if you're employing some of the principles of what the, you know, fertilizer reductions, getting rid of the seed treatment, getting rid of this fungicide um, and reduction in synthetic fertilizers, there's going to be a, you know, an easily a 15 cent premium or 15% premium that, you know, I'm pretty sure will be here within the next, within the next year. So, and there'll be, I think there's going to be a processor set up around Regina within the next, within the, within the next year, that'll be buying strictly bi- stuff based off of, based off of these practice, the regenerative practices. Yeah. I, I do believe consumers are pushing for that. And that, that's why we've been doing what we've been doing on our farm since 2015, between looking at soil health and overall efficiencies with our fertilizer, we're, we're trying to grow better end product, better seed for people to have better, healthier food that, you know, is just better for them all around to eat and, you know, hopefully will help, you know, uh, fight disease in the long run and, and the whole nine yards. But we, we've been just really working on trying to get away from, from every sort of chemical that we can. We're, we're definitely not organic. We're still using some synthetic fertilizers. Uh, we haven't, we've been seed treatment free since 2016 and fungicide and pesticide free since then also. Um, so we're, we're really working at becoming, uh, as close to regenerative as we can, it's just, uh, I do lack, uh, a lot in my soils, but we have incorporated, uh, cattle and manure and, and really changing, changing up what, what we're doing. And also we're going to start intercropping and using ACF in conjunction with, with our intercrops in, in 2021. 